Hello, colleagues, and welcome to week three, the beginning of uh, an annual celebration of our liberties and freedoms and great blessings here in our country, the United States of America. Happy 4th of July to you tomorrow. If you have a long weekend, I pray that you're using it in a way that gives you a rest and opportunity to celebrate your blessings. If you have to work this weekend, thank you for doing so. Please take time to thank God for the blessings that we have here in this great land of ours. Well, as we come out of week two and move into week three, I wanted to take just a moment to follow up on major assignments that were completed last week and are about to be graded and posted to your grade books. I want to remind you that written assignments will be graded with comments provided. Some of you have already begun to see that. As you've turned in papers, I've responded to them with comments and provided a grade. Be sure to read the comments and make the appropriate adjustments moving forward. That's for your benefit so that you can continue to increase your skills and proficiency at writing in our short written essays here in our course, and that uh, you can maximize the opportunity for a great grade. Remember that in our first two written essays, the word count ranges of 500 to 700 words. And in the last one, we'll talk about that way on down the line, 900 to 1200 words for essay three. Those apply to the main body of the paper only. Front matter, such as your name, the course name and number, the instructor, the date, such uh, material as the citations page with all of your references, that does not uh, 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 consist of the main body of the paper. Those are beginnings and endings to your paper. So when you write one of our short essays in weeks uh, uh, two last week, five coming up, 500 to 700 words in the main body below the title, all the way through to your conclusion. A little more for paper three. We'll get to that a little bit later in the course. Always provide a descriptive creative title for your written essays. Paper two or short written essay or um, week two assignment. Those are identifications of the assignment themselves, but they are not creative descriptive titles. I've given some feedback for those that I've graded so far. I will continue to do that. Now, it's not hurting you a great deal now. I'm just trying, trying to provide some good direction. Not every instructor does it this way, but this is how it will work in our course. I want you to provide uh, a descriptive, creative title for every essay. Uh, something, for example, like in essay two, is it ever morally permissible to cheat? Something like that. It's descriptive, it's creative, and it identifies the topic that we're going to be addressing. Um, it's not listed here on this screen, but I do want to call attention to the required use of course materials first, course materials first, before you go searching anywhere else on the internet or do any other research um, for sources, and then always use scripture. So keep those things in mind moving forward. I wanted to quickly review with us as well, coming out of week two, because this is going to be important moving forward through the rest of the course. These distinctions that are made in the various forms of moral or natural law that are being described by our authors, uh, we're going to be talking about this a lot as we move forward. I'm taking a little time to review that chart that you've had in week two from Thomas Aquinas. The large banner under which he places all of God's mandates is what he calls the, quote, eternal law. He defines that as the supreme wisdom or God's wise plan that governs the universe, which exists in the mind of God himself. So all morality, all sense of what is right and what is wrong, issues from the very character, nature, and revelation of God. Now, under that broad title from Aquinas are two other broader subtitles. One he calls the laws of nature. You'll remember in week one, uh, C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity referred to the laws of nature, the fixed order by which God commands all of nature. This is going to include physics, chemistry, biology, thermodynamics. The law of gravity never changes, right? Um, that is fixed 
it's not going to change. But then distinguished from the laws of nature are what Lewis and Aquinas referred to as the quote moral law. Uh, uh, Lewis uses interchangeably the phrase natural law, not the laws of nature, but natural law. These are the divine rules of right and wrong governing man's free choices. Under that subtitle are two more from Thomas Aquinas, one that he calls natural law, the law in us by nature, which is written on the hearts of all human beings. Paul makes reference to this in Romans chapter two. God's written this sense of knowing what is right and wrong on the hearts of human beings. And then more specifically, more precise is what Aquinas refers to as divine law, also called God's law, which is given to humanity by God himself and recorded in Holy Scripture. This is going to include the Decalogue morality, the Ten Commandments, which is where we're starting. Now, below those two is another category distinguished and independent known as human law or other social norms, the rules of right and wrong man imposes upon himself. In America, in the U.S., we drive on the left side, uh, or excuse me, <laughs> the right side of the street. In England, they just they drive on the left side of the street. And so uh, those are human laws, social norms, or legalities. Those are not to be confused with divine law or natural law. Sometimes they coincide, but often they do not. And certainly the human law does not have the same authority as either natural law or divine law. Wanted to share that with you just by way of review. Here's a little more precision. Eternal law, according to Aquinas, is identical to the mind of God as seen by God himself. It can be called law because God stands to the universe which he creates as a ruler as a community does in which he rules. When God reasons, God's reason is considered as it is understood by God himself, uh, that is, it is therefore unchanging, eternal nature, it is eternal law. Divine law, according to Aquinas, is derived from eternal law. Remember, it's one of the sub subdivisions, as it appears historically to humans, especially through revelation, such as when it appears to human beings as divine commands. The Old Testament, law of Moses, the Ten Commandments. Divine law is divided into the old law, the new law. Uh, the old and new law roughly correspond to the old and new testaments of the Bible. When he speaks of the new law, Thomas, Thomas Aquinas, is thinking mainly of the Ten Commandments. When he speaks of the new law, he's speaking primarily of the teachings of Jesus. So once again, some important distinctions, clarifications of terms and concepts, going to be important moving forward. In week three, we're going to be looking at the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, a bit more closely. This is what's going to be called divine law. And we're going to see what are known in divine law uh, as positive duties and negative duties. They are absolutes. When God speaks, then that settles the matter. And so it is always the same. It will always be the same. It does not change. We might not always obey. We might not always uh, comply, but the law itself never changes. There are some positive duties generally that we find in the Ten Commandments. Broadly, love God and love thy neighbor. Love your neighbor. Love God in the first four. I am the Lord your God that brought you up out of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me, right? Don't bow down before any graven image that you've made. Don't take my name in useless, thoughtless, profane ways. Remember the Sabbath day. Love God. Love your neighbor. Starting with commandment five, honor your mother and your father. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Uh, do not steal. Do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Uh, do not covet. All of these become ways that we demonstrate love toward our neighbors. There are other positive duties and negative duties, what you should and should not do that grow out of those. Philip Ryken began addressing that in uh, chapter three of his book, Written in Stone. Um, but these positive and negative duties 
um, constantly exist. Uh, they can be positive in thou shalts, negatives in thou shalt nots. Now, what we're going to also look at is the difference between what could be called uh, positive duties and negative duties in the sense that they are perfect or imperfect in nature. Negative duties, once again, what must what one must should or must not do, and positive duties, what one must should or must do. A little bit of rewording there. Perfect and imperfect duties. I'm going to read more about this. These are things that are always right or wrong. They are moral absolutes. Perfect duties are obligations that are always in place no matter what the situation might be. It is never permissible to premeditatedly take the life of another human being um, who is innocent. So you shall not murder, right? But there are imperfect duties, those duties that do not produce the same obligation for everyone in every circumstance. For example, um, we may be in a situation where in order to do the absolute positive thing in respecting the sanctity of life, say in the case of abortion, or later on in our course, we're going to look at um, physician-assisted suicide. We may run counter to human law, which says one thing or another, or dictates one thing or another, but we have a moral duty to the perfect duty of the absolute. Sometimes imperfect duties give way to the perfect duties. So if it's a matter of obeying God or men, Peter said in Acts chapter 4, we must obey God rather than men, right? And so in the case of the sanctity of life and protecting it, even though the laws might permit or restrict, it's what God says that becomes the perfect duty and what human law says is the imperfect duty. See where we're coming from there? Perfect duties always take precedence. Imperfect duties can come into conflict with other duties or considerations. Here's an example. Now look at the sign on the left, beautiful lake. But here is a negative duty, right? No swimming. Well, there's a lot of reasons for that. Safety, lack of lifeguard, um, the inability to know whether one can actually swim or they're capable of it. So they've just ruled it out, right? No swimming. But look at the depiction on the right. Here's someone who is drowning. Now, those that are committed to preserving the sanctity of life are going to overrule in their conscience, in their heart and moral decision making, the sign that says no swimming so you can dive in and save the person who is drowning. You see the difference between a perfect duty and an imperfect duty, right? The negative duty, no swimming, is overruled by the positive duty, protect the sanctity and value of human life. Hopefully this helps. It's a little foundation for what you're going to read this week, and particularly when we start moving into our week three group dialogue, perfect and negative, uh, positive and negative duties, perfect and imperfect duties are going to play a role in what we do. So here we are in the week of uh, July 4th, Independence Day, beginning today, Monday. Our theme this week is family life, citizenship, and civility. We're going to be looking specifically at the fifth command, honor your father and your mother. Growing out of that fifth command is the moral implication that we have duty to those in authority. Now, what we're going to be looking at this week are the concepts of justice. What does it mean to live in a just society or for a law to bring justice or maybe a law to be unjust, right? We're going to look at this concept again of perfect and imperfect duties with a bit more detail, positive and negative duties with a, uh, a bit more detail. And we're going to look at what it means to respect God at all times and in every circumstances and what he has dictated compared with or contrasted with what human beings might be prone to think or do, or command or direct. So several important readings this week. Chapter 8 from our main text, Philip Riken, written in stone, Respect Authority. We're going to read from Joseph Pfeiffer, 
in the four cardinal virtues, his chapter eight called the limits of justice. And we're going to see just how far justice can extend and what it should extend to, and then what we're not capable of in providing justice. We're gonna read a fascinating piece, now historic, from the late Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, some excerpts from his now famous and watershed document letter from a Birmingham jail in which he's looking at this concept of nonviolent action uh, in order to protest or to respond to unjust laws and unjust behavior. We're gonna look at perfect duties, positive and negative, imperfect duties, positive and negative. I think it's gonna be a pretty important and exciting read for you if you've not read it before. So contemporary still. And then finally, an overview defining and explaining perfect duties and imperfect duties. So as we move into our assignments for this week then, what we're going to be doing is engaging in our first group dialogue. But for this week's dialogue, respond to the prompt stated below. You're going to read through this dialogue prompt about a British court, lower court ruling in 2019 about a mentally disabled woman being ordered that she must have an abortion, even though the order was against both the woman's wishes and her parents' wishes. And here are the questions that you're going to answer in your group dialogue. Would the parents be morally justified in defying the authority of the court? Is the principle, quote, respect authority a perfect duty, or is it imperfect? We'll talk about that in our course materials. In what way is the duty to obey a court order and the parent's responsibility, both to their daughter and to God, related to justice? So we're going to get definitions and understandings of this from our course readings. So in this original post, the one that's going to be due by Wednesday, 250 to 350 words, you write about that, answering those questions. I'm going to be looking for the terms perfect and imperfect duties, how you understand them and how you apply them to this case. I'm going to be looking for the term justice, how you understand it based on our course materials and how you apply it to this particular case. Think about what scripture has to say and uh, um, construct your post and uh, submit it, post it by Wednesday by the end of the day. Now, let me show you where to go in doing that. We're gonna to go to the community board here real quick. And if you'll notice way down here at uh, week seven, or excuse me, week three assignment dialogue, go right in here, a couple of students have already done so, create a thread. You don't need to create a separate document and open it or submit it here. Create a thread as you go in here put a title on the thread, then type or compose your um, dialogue post right there. That way everyone else can see it. It'll pop up right in here for others to see. That's due by Wednesday night, 250 to 300 words. Then if you notice, if we come back to course content again and look in uh, week three, we've got uh, a response or a reply to make by Sunday of 100 to 125 words. So be sure, get into the word count range on both of these, um, provide good substantive discussion, be sure you address perfect and imperfect duties and justice. I'm looking for both the terms, how you define and explain them and how you apply them uh, and then submit your work. Uh, here's a group uh, dialogue rubric for you to see how we're going to how we're going to grade it. So again, I think everything that you're needing is in place right there. That's how week three is going. I will be posting grades for the week two quiz as well as the week two uh, short written essay as they come in and I complete them. I'm finishing up another course with grades due this coming Wednesday. So probably mid to latter week, you can watch for your grades on those things to pop up. Uh, I usually try to get that done within about five to six days following uh, the beginning of a new week. So if you've submitted already, I could well have already graded some of them. Be watching for that later in the week. I am nearby if needed. Let's have a great week three together. God bless.